was on the big screen. A Star is Born has proved itself to be one of the most successful Hollywood brands. Now, Matthew Morrison tells the story behind all four versions of this incredible film. I will explore the timeless appeal of the Rags to Riches and Riches to Rags movie that attracted Judy Garland, Barbara Streisand, and now Lady Gaga. That is a tale that can be told forever. A Star is Reborn. Available to hear on the BBC Sounds app. Dusty really chose great songs, lyrically and musically. She was a great interpreter of the lyrics. Her songs just work. I mean, they're, they're timeless. She was so versatile. She could do anything. Welcome to Definitively Dusty. I'm Tris Penner and worked at EMI Records where I first met Dusty in 1987 and we became instant good friends. In this second of three programmes, we hear how Dusty's solo success led to a recording contract in America with Atlantic Records and her work on the landmark Dusty and Memphis album. This woman was so ahead of everyone, she even recorded an album with producers Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff before they became well known for the sound of Philadelphia. Speaking to her close friends and those who worked with her in the studio and on her live shows, we hear how she was as a performer and how in the 1970s, she made the decision to follow her dream, to live in America. Plus, with access to extraordinary unheard interviews and recording sessions, Dusty tells her story through her music and in her own words. Day, if I'm standing in the wings and they say Dusty Springfield, I want to say who? Dusty really was a shy person. And yes, in a way, she was two people. Somewhere there was a conscious decision that I don't like that other person, Mary O'Brien, and I really have to do something about it. How does Mary O'Brien become Dusty Springfield? She goes to Harrods, buys a black sheath dress, a row of pearls, puts her hair up in a chignon. The makeup, the wigs, were all a part of the Dusty Springfield image. It's an act every time. Mentally, physically, every way. And behind that lurked Mary O'Brien, who was somebody quite different that only her friends and close friends she allowed to see. Basically, I'm just Mary O'Brien slopping around the garden looking for the cat. But you know, if I were just that person, I'd be totally dissatisfied. I'm glad that Mary O'Brien can escape into Dusty Springfield and Dusty Springfield can say, disappear. I was gonna say something quite rude then and become Mary O'Brien. I'm Vicky Wickham. I knew Dusty really well. We were friends since 1963. And there are many stories about her sitting at the table and throwing bread rolls at people. And I think it was just to relieve the tension. 
any of those formal get-togethers where if it's press or if it's, you know, something, were boring as hell. And thank God there were some people in the press that she liked and could talk to, like Penny Valentine or Keith Oltham. I warmed to her quite quickly because she was such fun. We discovered quite early on that we were both fans of The Goons, the early radio program that Spike Milligan, Peter Sellers and Harry Seacombe put together. Dusty did an excellent Neddy Seagoon. Ah, right, and go to all, yeah, Blue Bottle. Right. Who understands it? All you can do is just enjoy it, particularly when the singer explodes. I think I have a very deep relationship with that moment. Dusty's humour could be really dark. She loved when things kind of went wrong when they were funny. We were working at the Talk the North Club and had a, a two-stage rostrum. Dusty's MD, Dougie Reese. On the back rostrum was a white baby grand piano. Before Dusty came on, we used to play a song. Derek Andrews, the trumpet player, felt he needed just a little bit more space. So he just gave the piano a little nudge. The next thing we know, the grand piano had come off the top of the rostrum and rolled over the stage and ended up on the dance floor with its legs in there like a dead fly. And it was an incredible sound. Dusty was ready to come on but laughed so much, all her makeup run down her face, and she couldn't go on. Dusty had one party which was legendary. Her mum and dad were there, a lot of friends were there. Kim Weston arrived in a big fur coat. She made such a great entrance. Martha and the Vandellas were there. Dusty had a bit of drink and decided she was going to make me white and she was going to be black. She used flour and cocoa, and I stopped her from doing that. <laughs> it was such a chaotic party. Dusty was throwing sardines at people, little sardines, which would land in people's handbags if they left them open. <laughs> There was one occasion when I was down at Ready Steady Go in Wembley, and she said, uh, you play footy, don't you? I said, yeah, I play soccer at the weekends. Come and give Scylla a good booting for me back in the dressing room. We got back to her dressing room, and Scylla turned out to be a wig. She had three, one called Scylla, one called Lulu, one called Sandy. She had a Sandy wig. Isn't that amazing? Singer Sandy Shaw. I love that. Thank you for telling me that. I didn't know. She was having a bit of trouble with Scylla. We booted it around the dressing room for about 20 minutes, and there was a knock on the door, and the Rolling Stones were getting changed in the dressing room next door, and it was Brian Jones, who kind of laughingly said, could we please keep the noise down? Because he had a groupie in there who couldn't pay attention to the job in hand. At which point, Dusty picked up a glass ashtray and threw it at his head, just as he was closing the door, which fortunately missed and dented the door quite severely. <laughs> We had tons of parties. Any musician that was in town came. Mostly we laughed and giggled. That was it. And we watched the first episode of Monty Python, and we laughed all the time. My name is Norma Tanega. Midnight Sounds I wrote especially for her. It's a jazz song. I always thought she had a beautiful voice. It's uh, unique. And I thought that she should sing jazz. The moon was drifting round midnight stone. The moon was ever bright, caught my light. The night was quiet. From her second solo album onwards, Dusty took an active part in supervising her recordings. How was that? You have to play the whole thing? During the 60s, she released several studio albums for Philips that were overseen by producer Johnny Franz. But a lot of the time, Dusty did her own creative production work. She had an incredible ear for music and knew exactly what sound she wanted to create in the studio. She was so musical. She could hear if there was 10 violins, she could tell you if one of them was slightly off. Creepy, I mean, just so musical. 
everything had to be dead right. I think she worried about things. Arranger Keith Mansfield. Whether things were right in the recording or the arrangement. She was a perfectionist. She wanted everything to be, however good it was, it could have been that little bit better. She had a, such a reputation, almost as bad as mine, in the studio, for being picky and choosy. And nowadays, that would be normal for any performer or artist. But in those days, coming from a woman or a girl, we were called difficult. But I think this was due to the fact that probably on a lot of the early solo records, they were asking musicians to play a style that they didn't know. If you heard the American records, they had a different feel to them than most English records. And certainly if they were black records, there was something there which we would find hard to compete on the same level. She just wanted the funk and she wasn't really getting it with all these white, kind of staid musicians. Musician Carol Pope. I think probably if she was a man, of course, they would have done what she wanted. I'm now going to describe to you the recording of I Close My Eyes and Count to Ten. They had this idea they wanted two pianos. And we had my two favourite piano players at the time. One was Alan Hawkshaw and the other was a guy called Steve Gray. They were both wonderful pianists. It is the way that you look And it is the way that you talk It is the things that you say or do Make me want you so Plus the whole orchestra in the studio at the same time. It has nothing to do with the wine Or the music that's flooding my mind But never before have I been so sure You're the someone I dreamed I would find Every time she sang, it was a master. It's the way you make me feel The moment I am close to you it's a feeling so unreal, so hard to believe it's true. The pounding I feel in my heart, the hoping that we'll never part. I can't believe this is really happening to me. One song I do remember was Am I the Same Girl? So I remember that session. Once again, Dusty just had that great um, feel for those American rhythm and blues style numbers. She spotted into the beat so naturally. Her intonation was always good and because they were her kind of songs, it was so natural hearing her phrasing, and nothing was uncomfortable about it. The Color of Your Eyes, that was written especially for her. There's this little girl voice again, this little girl lost quality that she always had. Who am I? And it's deeply affecting. To say you didn't love me When I can't remember The color The colour of your eyes. I'm Pat Rhodes. I was Dusty's PA for nearly 40 years. 
When she first met Bert Bacharach, she adored his songs and he'd written a song for her and she was scared of meeting him, but at the same time she was dying to meet him. I was playing at the Liverpool Empire. I remember leaving there, catching a plane on a Sunday and having dinner with Bert Bacharach on a Sunday night. And we went to his apartment and he played me that song. But I just don't know what to do with myself. I just don't know what to do with myself. So it was a very productive trip, and I remember exactly where we ate. It's a place called Dawson's Pub. It's on third. Yeah. He was really handsome. It still is. And now that we're through, I just don't know what to do with my time. She always worried what he would think of her treatment of one of his songs. I couldn't sing everything Bacharach wrote because he wrote truly difficult things. They had such meat in them and they were such great songs. When I'm not with you, I just don't know what to do Like a summer road She said once to me when we did an interview that any song that was submitted to her, she would first read it and see whether she could feel the lyric. Then she would find out what the music was and build upon the music. She was a great interpreter of the lyric, like a good actor. Just waiting for you I don't know what else to do Like a summer road The only thing she ever regretted was missing out on anyone who had a heart because he did say he had written that for her and I think Dusty was away at the time. Somebody else asked for it and that broke her heart because she loved that song. Meeting writers was a very unnerving experience for me because A, I always thought they sang it better than I did. B, I found it very hard to be objective because I like them so much in many cases. I remember it was Valerie Simpson and Nick Ashford they uh, said, well, we've got to play this for you, but we feel we should tell you. We really want you to have it, but on the other hand, we, we really need to sign with Motown, and we, we hope we do, but if we don't, you can have it. And they sat down and played the opening rise of Ain't No Mountain High Enough, and it's like, I just, my mouth dropped open. And musically, it was everything that was stunning to me. Ain't no mountain high, ain't no valley low, ain't no river. Then the next week, they signed with Motown. <laughs> Dusty really chose great songs. She loved Carole King. Most everything she writes, I want to sing. They have a cadence to them that seems to fall right from my voice. Gotta give me some, give me some, some of you are loving most of these. You gotta give me some of your loving. No, I'm not a It's the only record Something Eleven I ever took home and played 14 times over. Normally I don't play them for at least a year because I'm incapable of being objective. I wish I could write like her. I wish I could write. Going back kind of says it all. I think that's one of the ultimate great stories in a song.
I knew that she was fiercely possessive of going back. She wanted to do it herself. She was the writer, and it was a very special song to her. Something primitive, emotional feeling, and that's what I felt about the song. And she let me do it. And to have that praise from her, I burst into tears because it was the ultimate accolade from someone who wanted to do it herself and to praise me for doing it and liking it. I just thought I've never felt happier. Now there's more to do than watch my sailboat fly. And every day can be my magic of the And I can play hide and seek with And it was that really got me a contract with Atlantic. It was Atlantic's idea to try the Memphis thing. Jerry Wexler and Tom Dowd had recorded down there a lot and thought that that would be an interesting experiment. I'm Jerry Greenberg, and I joined Atlantic Records in 1967 as Jerry Wexler's assistant. The first project was to find songs for a Dusty Springfield. The whole plan was to get a group of songs together, see what songs she wanted to record. They were constantly sending me tapes, and that's where I heard Son of a Preacher Man and Just a Little Lovin'. And I thought, eh, yeah, well, maybe it'll be all right. And she ultimately was the one that decided on Son of a Preacher Man and any of the songs that went in to the Dusty and Memphis album. Part of the deal with Atlantic was that she would have Jerry Wexler produce her. It was the first time she had ever recorded this style using just the rhythm section and just woodshedding, you know, working off the chord patterns. I mean, creating an arrangement on the spot. Dusty Springfield had never recorded this way. She'd always worked with preset arrangements where the rhythm and the strings and the voice, everybody was there. Uh, here, with some guys playing, you know, a guy drums, bass, guitar, and piano, it was up to her to indicate the direction of where the strings and horns would be coming. And she was very uncomfortable with this. Dusty would really get herself into a state. When she was in a state, she couldn't function. I mean, she really made herself almost physically sick. I had very bad laryngitis throughout that entire album. She had to, you know, go through it and then come out the other end. And that actually, that haunted her a lot of her life. Unfortunately, no master vocals were recorded in Memphis. Weeks later, the team moved to New York. She must have been listening and absorbing in her own mind so that when she finally came to sing, overdubbing the songs in New York, they were perfect. Can I cry a little bit? There's nobody to notice it. Can I cry? If I want to, no one can. I never really believed anyone. So that element of fear can cause a lot of uh, inhibited singing. It took a lot to break that down, that critic in me. And they did it. I mean, they, they got it out of me somehow or other. I will always be grateful. And they made a really good record out of it. When she'd made the album, she was so proud of it. I mean, she played me down the phone, Son of a Preacher Man, about 20 times, and was just jumping up and down with, what do you think, isn't it great? Billy Ray was a preacher's son, and when his daddy would visit, he'd come along. When they gathered around and started talking, that's when Billy would take me a walk in. Out through the backyard, we go walk in. Then he look into my eyes. Lord knows to my surprise, the only one could ever reach me was the son of a preacher man the only boy who could ever teach me was 
the son of a preacher man You see he was, he was Yeah, well, I like Aretha's version a lot better. She did it the way that I wish I'd done it. That often happens when you hear somebody do it afterwards. She'll phrase it. The only one who could ever reach me. Where went? The only one who could ever reach me was the son of a preacher man. The only boy who could ever teach me was the son of a preacher man. Yes, he was. He was. Now, what if I do it? On stage, I caught her phrasing because that's the way I should have done it. How well I remember the look that was in his eyes, stealing kisses from me on the slide, taking time to make time, telling me that he's all mine, learning from each other's knowing, looking to see how much we've grown, and the only one who could ever reach me was the son of a preacher man. In fact, it was very successful. But it was a song that never really knocked me out. I just know a hit song when I hear it. Although Dusty in Memphis sold poorly when it was first released in 1969, the album has since been acclaimed as one of the greatest records of all time. You're listening to Definitively Dusty on BBC Radio 2. You've been crying, your face is a mess. Come in, baby, you can dry the tears of my dress. Dusty spent most of 69 working in America and deciding she wanted to work with another production team, she moved on to Philadelphia to cut her next album, A Brand New Me, with Leon Huff and Kenny Gamble. People had said, you know, like she's temperamental and, you know, whatever, but I didn't see any of that. You know, me and Huff, we were laughing most of the time. We had a beautiful time with Dusty. I used to always tell her, I said, look, I said, we experiment, so work with us. She was just saying, okay, you know what I mean? She was so humble. She knew that we wanted the best for her. There's a couple ballads on that album that were really, really good. The star of my show. Her process in recording was basically give her a little tea and give her that track, put that track on there. And, and right away, you would know whether or not a song was really compatible to her. The keys had to be right for her. And we do the rhythm tracks first. Then give the tracks to the artists so that they can rehearse to that track. Then after they rehearse to the track and get it the way they want it, we get the background voices and everything in there that we want. 
we go in the studio and put the artist's lead vocal. Then we put the sweetening on it, like horns or strings or whatever. And then we go back in the studio and mix it. The mixing process, in my view, was that was the most tedious. <laughs> A lot of hours, <laughs> but it was all worth it. Brand New Me was perfect for her. This is my same old clothes. You know, these are my same old clothes, my same, my same old, old shoes. shoes. I was the same old me with the same old blues. The one thing that I used to do with her a lot is keep reminding her to pronounce the words. Because sometimes she could sing and you don't know what she's saying. She'd be like mumbling a little bit. And I'd say, hey, come on, baby. I don't know what you're talking about. And she would fall out laughing. So you got to be able to understand the words, especially with a voice like that. A brand new smile Since I met you, baby One of the most important things that happened with Atlantic and Dusty Springfield was Dusty telling Jerry Wexler, the session bass player that I use all the time in England, named John Paul Jones, is about to form a band with Jimmy Page, who's leaving the Yardbirds. Jerry's eyes lit up and immediately jumped on the phone with Jimmy Page's lawyer and said, I want this new band, and I can tell you honestly that Dusty Springfield was responsible for Led Zeppelin signing with Atlantic Records. Dusty Springfield had grown up with a love of Hollywood musicals and always enjoyed the dressing up and dramatics that were an essential part of show business. Dust used to go to the talk of the town on a regular basis, and a whole group of us would go with her, so we had a big table. And we saw such an array of artists, from Ethel Merman, Frances Fay, Shirley Bassey, Judy Garland, just the greatest singers, entertainers, performers. And Danny LaRue had a club, and we would go there a lot. And actually, she would always be quite annoyed that some of his dresses were better than hers. I got so little time to We do. went to a show somewhere, and Diana Dawes was on, and Dusty peeped into her dressing room, and she saw these fabulous dresses. So she looked at the label, saw the name Darnell. So she thought, wow, that's what I want. So we found Darnell's in London, and she started having her clothes made there. I can remember the weight of them. How she danced around in them, I have no idea. Dusty Live at the Talk of the Town. That was a beautiful show. I'm the good ship, lollipop. She did the Shirley Temple impression and dance routines, and it was wonderful. It wasn't really Shirley Temple, it was any trial star. I wanted to get the orchestration exactly right, a la 40s musicals, which I was raised on. And so I got a guy in from New York to do it, and he wrote it exactly right. And I gave him a bowl of hat, and he was thrilled to bits. I also gave him a lot of money for writing it. On the good ship, and we did this really awful tap dance, which was every tap cliche. I got good enough at it to make it look suitably awful. I like doing stuff that has got nothing to do with, with being Dusty Springfield.
My name's Gary Moore, and I was a technical engineer for the Philips Recording Studios. I got involved in the album See All Her Faces in the fall of 1971. This was primarily just only to add Dusty's vocals to the album. I checked all the gear out and retired to one of the little rooms, the little side rooms of the studio, and in comes herself, Dusty Springfield. She said, look, before I make records, I come in here and just get myself ready, so to speak, you know. Well, I said, I'll leave you to it. No, she said, you stay here, actually. And uh, she said, I just fancy somebody to talk to at the moment. And she said, could you pop around the corner and pick us up a bottle of red? And I said, no problem. Came back with this nice bottle of red wine and bang, 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 knock on the door. And the tape up, Keith Whiting came in. Oh, he said, uh, Mr. Franz has arrived, the record producer, and is ready for Miss Springfield. Dusty said, well, you tell Mr. Franz I'm not quite ready yet. I'm just relaxing, unwinding. So chat, 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 Dusty and I drink, talking about our favorite singers. Keith comes in again. Mr. Franz wants to know, are you ready to record yet? Not yet. After about another 15 minutes, Keith comes in again. Mr. Franz wants to know if you are ready to make the record. And she said, tell Mr. Franz that I am not going to make any records as long as he remains in the building. And of course, poor old Keith just looked at him, flabbergasted, and off he went. He came back in again and said, look, uh, Mr. Franz has now left. Dusty said, well, that's it. She said, let's pop into the control room and make some records. And that's exactly what we did. Yesterday. There had often been rumours in the press hinting at Dusty's sexuality. So in 1970, during a tough interview with Ray Connolly of the Evening Standard, she bravely declared that, I know I'm perfectly as capable of being swayed by a girl as by a boy. The papers kept hounding her, they kept hinting, then they came out and said she was gay. And she used to be in tears sometimes over that. What gets me is the difference between what they say and what actually is. She said, why should that matter? I sing, that's what matters. And I think in the end she thought, oh, to hell with it, I'll just tell them. She was bisexual, and she was. She loved men and women. And was a wild child, admittedly, and was fairly promiscuous. Anyone who was nice to me, I just sort of went, okay, all right, I'll come home with you. It was that sort of thing, but it was never very serious. It was very difficult in the 70s for artists to come out as bisexual or gay or lesbian because you didn't want to alienate your fan base or people in the industry. Musician Carol Pope. It was a revolutionary act for Dusty to say I'm bisexual and I just applaud her. I love how open she was. I must have seen Dusty about 30 times. Lifelong Dusty Springfield Uber fan and author Paul Howes saw Dusty perform live many times, on stage and for television and radio appearances. This was December 1972. At the time, I worked quite near the talk of the town, and fortunately, we booked tickets for the first night. And during the day, I heard rumours that Dusty wasn't going to turn up, Dusty was ill. Come the night, and come half past 11 when she was due on stage, no Dusty. 12 o'clock, no Dusty. By this time, the spoons were tapping on the table. <laughs> well, nobody would believe she had the most awful 
infection in her throat. They thought, oh, she's just putting it on, she's doing it to, you know, get sympathy and all that, and it wasn't. Eventually, about quarter past 12, Dusty came on. There were some songs that she just wasn't able to sing. I think she virtually spoke the lyrics. But even Dusty, when she spoke with a croaky voice, could sound good. <laughs> oh, that makes everyone very tense and they all fall over and enjoy it. You know, it's, we're all drama queens. <laughs> we just enjoy it. <laughs> we were more aware of Dusty's inhibitions and you sat there and waited, just hoping, <laughs> wishing and hoping. Is that sort of almost tragic quality of is this person going to make it or not? And you can feel the audience practically lifting you up. You just willed her to carry on to the end. I'd love to have an easy time on stage, but it never works out that way. I mean, I really need the audience to lift me up, and they do. She did about between an hour and 75 minutes. It was like a party atmosphere. And I thought, this is the sort of performance you'll never, ever see again. Of course, the next day, there were reports about her being sacked by the management of the Talk of the Town. Early in the 70s, I sensed that they had were beginning to have enough of me, and I was certainly beginning to have enough of, of the disenchantment I was feeling. You know, I, I didn't know what else I could do. I, I don't know, it's just that it wasn't stimulating anymore, and it wasn't fun anymore. I needed that sense of, of fun, of, of enjoyment in, in the work, because it wasn't coming over. It all became very serious and almost a, a drudgery. Dusty knew that if she stayed, she'd end up in pantomime. She'd already played the working men's clubs, which were what you did in those days. There really was nowhere to go. You can't go on waving your arms around and directing traffic and singing like that forever. And I couldn't uh, see myself progressing in any way. So I decided to make the gigantic leap. She decided that America, which she loved, she loved the American films, she loved, of course, the American music. And I think she just saw herself fitting in there and becoming part of the American scene. Dusty also had an American girlfriend, Norma, Norma Denega, and I think that also lent her towards America. When I came to the States, so much of my image had been intermittent. I had no real broad range image. It was just a sort of blonde beehive and miniskirts waving her arms around singing whatever happened to be a hit at that time. And then when I came over here, having always been fascinated with the States in general and feeling that that I could perform to an American audience and that they would like me, that, that they would always be critical. It has been an absolute delight to discover that they are no more critical, in fact, sometimes less so, and far kinder than a lot of European audiences. I think to, because there's so many people that there is an audience for everything. Dusty was living and working in Los Angeles, which had become the center of the American recording industry, and 1973 saw the release of her album Cameo. Sadly, it made no impact on the charts, and a follow-up album Longing was abandoned midway through recording because of personal difficulties and professional exhaustion. She spent the mid-70s outside of music, resurfacing in 1978 with a new album, the aptly titled It Begins Again. We've got a lot more songs than, than finished up on the album. We didn't record them. We would have an A list and a B list and a C list and juggle them around until we found what seemed to be the most substantial mixture. I like Checkmate too, she's a second one, a friend of mine, Nona Hendrix, and she's a very good songwriter. Interesting construction of the song. Queen to your 
I'm Nona Hendrix. I'm a singer songwriter. One of the most memorable musical times with Dusty was the fact that she recorded a song that I wrote. And it was just amazing for me to write a song and have a singer who I admired and loved record it. In 1979, Dusty released the album Living Without Your Love and returned to the UK for a tour, which unfortunately ended up being just three nights at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. It's rather like playing the London Palladium. There are so many ghosts in that theatre. There's a mirror on the side of the stage at Drury Lane. It was used by Sir Henry Irving, and it's the same mirror that you check yourself out you know, just before you go on stage. It's great. I went two or three nights. The one thing that really got me was when she began to sing I'm Coming Home Again, the audience reaction was such that she broke down in tears. I'm not as crazy as I used to be Some of my devils let me see. She was happiest on stage when people applauded. It was very real. By that time, Dusty had become quite Americanized and she was more strident. She did a sort of Bette Midler type section called Roll Arena where she came on roller skates. She said, well, Pat, you can stand one side of the stage and Tony, my husband, could stand the other side and he can gently push me on. And then as I come across, you can catch me the other side. Unfortunately, there was a slope on the floor. But she did make it, but it wasn't what you call graceful. <laughs> Dusty, just out of the blue, had come back from the States, called me up at the studios and said, look, I'm doing a concert at the Albert Hall and I want you to do the sound. And she insisted, absolutely insisted I do it. And um, it was a terrifying experience, I must tell you. The Albert Hall concert, 1979, I did the sound check for her. So she sat at the desk and I sang. I'm Simon Bell. I was Dusty's backing singer from 1978. One of the finest singers I've ever heard. The only guy I know who can sing like that. I think she was flattering me, but I did the hand movements better than her. <laughs> She would be running across the stage, dancing and so on, on the up-tempo numbers, and then she would know how to stand still in the spotlight to draw you in to one of those intimate, big ballad songs. She was mesmerizing. I have no, or very little technical expertise, breathing and using the vocal equipment properly. And I'm afraid I just don't do it. I mean well when I go on stage, but I just lose contact with any, any form of discipline. When we did rehearsals with Dusty, everything was just fine. Then something would happen, and when she came back, she was frantic, and it affected the voice and tightened it up. If she could keep the nerves together, it was wonderful. We were strangers a moment ago With a few dreams but nothing to show She was wise enough to take a lighting guy with her, Fred Perry, 
on all her live shows. I doubt if many other people did that. To me, I've always gone for the end effect and to hell with the cost. I really want to please the people and I'll do it any way I can. She knew that there was an illusion going on of sorts and to have the people around her who could fulfill that illusion. Following the success of the Royal Albert Hall concert, Dusty returned to Los Angeles and signed a new record contract with 20th Century Fox Records. I think when Dusty recorded White Heat, she wanted to reinvent herself and she was more open to different genres of music. I'm Carol Pope and I'm a singer songwriter who knew Dusty in the early 80s. I attended some of Dusty's White Heat sessions. Dusty recorded softcore with Kevin Staples, my co-writer. It was just Kevin and her and the piano. I love that you can hear her high heels clicking in the beginning of the track when she walks in. You brush by me and my whole facade just melts. It was a very theatrical song. It was very passionate. White Heat is a great, innovative album, and it's sad that it wasn't released in England. I applaud her for making that album. It's absolutely artistically daring. I wanna shout it, I wanna shout it. Tear my hair out. I wanna swear up and down. Tear my hair out. Can't see, understand your love. In the summer of 1980, she performed at the Greek Theatre, supporting singer-songwriter Peter Allen. I love um, that song which Peter Allen wrote about his mother-in-law, Judy Garland. This is really for all the people who have been legends in their time, I'm sure you know. And really, it's his song and he always does it, but for that night he made a gift of it to me. Sometimes the ladies that I'm speaking of give too much of themselves, sometimes not enough. Quietly. There are parallels in many cases. I think one of the dangers of being somebody like Judy Garland or whoever has a cult following, I'm not putting myself in that category. I do have a certain amount of cult following, but the really big cult followings can be really destructive because you get very caught up in the pleasing and feeding that cult. And the more you feed it, the more it destroys you. I think that's destroyed a lot of people over a period of time. In the next programme, Dusty, despite being ravaged with self-doubts, accepts a new challenge in the 80s that firmly re-establishes her as a worldwide star, bringing her back home. Quiet, please. <laughs> There's a lady on stage. I'm Tris Penner, and Definitively Dusty is a Sue Clark production. This is Radio 2 on the BBC Sounds app, on digital radio, and on 88 to 91 FM. BBC News at 10 o'clock. This is Tom Howrigan. 
A wave of coordinated bomb attacks on churches and hotels in Sri Lanka has left more than 200 people dead and 450 injured. There's been worldwide condemnation of the mass killing of Christians as they celebrated Easter. Mahesh Gunasekara from the Sri Lankan Red Cross says there's been a huge effort by medical staff to help the wounded. It's mostly really blast injuries, multiple fractures and some spinal damages as well. Hospital coped up very well. When the casualties came in, they took them in. Once they're stabilized, they were transferred back to some other hospitals because ICU facilities were stretched. Most of them has surgeons and all the other surgical staff has been coped up very well. The number of people arrested in connection with the climate change protests in London has risen to more than 950. Scotland Yard said 40 of those had been charged. Tonight, a Swedish teenager who's inspired schoolchildren worldwide to protest against global warming addressed a demonstration at Marble Arch in central London. Greta Thunberg told demonstrators humanity was standing at a crossroads.